Good afternoon, folks. I'm Dave Canterbury with Self Reliance Outfitters on the Pathfinder School. What I'd like to discuss with you this morning is coppicing. I did a recent talk at an event down in Louisville, Kentucky, at a prepper's convention, and I had about 150 people in the audience. And I asked a simple question: Who understands or knows what coppicing is? And only one person in the audience raised their hand. What that tells me is that we still have a lot to think about and a lot to learn about in the big picture of self-reliance. And coppicing is something that was practiced in Europe to manage resources and manage, manage wooded areas. What it boils down to is trees that grow very prolific, like the example of this tulip poplar behind me, which is one of the most prolific trees in the eastern woodlands. Willow is another very prolific tree that grows very, very quickly. The tulip poplar will grow 12 to 14 feet per year, depending on its environment. If you, in the winter time, coppice an area of trees, in other words, you cut down a larger tree close to the ground, the next year it will grow lots and lots of shoots off of that tree. And that number is going to vary, but it will grow several shoots off of that one stump. That becomes a mother tree almost. And I have a good example of that behind me. I have two tulip poplars that are probably 12 inches in diameter with seven other tulip poplars growing off the same stump that are anywhere from four to six inches in diameter. And if we cut that down, it will grow even more the following year and more the year after that. The more we cut it back, the more it's going to grow. Tulip poplar is a great resource to copus because it is, again, a very fast growing prolific tree in the eastern woodlands. For us, in the long term, that means extending the resource that we have. By taking one tree down, we create more. So we have to selectively coppice trees. And when we decide we're going to harvest a tree, we need to understand what we're going to harvest that resource for and understand that it's going to take several years for even a four inch sapling to grow from a copus log or a copus tree, but like I said with tulip poplar, at 10 to 12 feet a year, in a couple years you're going to have a tulip poplar the size of the one I have my hand on now. So you can practice copusing very easy to extend the resources that you have long term. Now, let's talk a little bit about making things out of wood and understanding how to harvest the proper trees for the projects that you want to make so that you know which trees to copus and which trees to leave for a resource you may need another day. Okay guys, so here we are back up at the blacksmith and classroom type area at the Pathfinder School where I've got a whiteboard. Now I want to discuss with you what we're going to do with this material that we're going to copus or harvest. And it's important to understand what pieces and parts and how big the material is we need to use for different projects because I see a lot of things done that I have made the exact same mistakes along the way. So if I can explain it to you now, maybe it will keep you from making those mistakes. Um, let me grab a marker here. First of all, let's talk about wood in general. Wood obviously is a cylinder that has rings inside of it that are growth rings, and then it has a very center pith. That pith is something that you're never going to want in a project unless you're using the wood in the round. That pith needs to go, okay? So if you're going to split a log for some reason or quarter a log for some reason, whatever you're doing with that log, you want to get rid of that pith area of the log and have a clean slate, per se, on the top of that piece of wood before you start working. Now, these rings are what cause us problems when we're working with wood. Along with the grain within that cylinder, we also have grain lines in that cylinder. And that grain can change direction if there's a knot and things like that, and that causes more problems. But speaking in generalities from harvesting this wood to make things like camp utensils, spoons, spatulas, bowls, cookses, those type things, Let's concentrate on that for a minute because those type green woodworking projects are going to be very common for you to do while you're bushcrafting and even in a self-reliance type situation where you may have to make some of the utensils that you have or that you need. 
So let's talk about this direction, not this direction. First of all, understand that most trees are at least two-thirds water when they're alive, and trees are made of fibers. We've discussed that before. As a tree dries, it's going to shrink. It's going to shrink a lot more in this direction than it's going to in this direction. So the potential for that thing to shrink from the round to a smaller round is where the biggest problem is going to come in. Once you cut that tree off, and you open it up to release moisture. Once you debark that tree and you open it up to lose moisture, that's when the problems are going to start occurring over time. So that's what we need to think about when we're making projects. So let's start with size of tree for certain things, all right? So if we have our six inch sapling that we cleave in half, and we want to make a spoon out of that, what we're going to need to do is understand that our weakness is here. And the best thing we can probably do, because it's going to stretch this direction when it's shrinking, the best thing that we can probably do is we have to cleave it again here and here, use this square for our spoon, and make our bowl the opposite direction that the growth rings are growing. That's going to give us the best potential for that spoon not to fail. Now, let's look at this same scenario on a little bigger scale. Let's take an 8 to 10 inch diameter tree like this. Now let's talk about bowls and cookses. And I've seen people try to make cookses out of a six inch diameter, and I've done it myself. And what you do is you cut the top off, come down here to make your bowl, and you've got the center of your tree right here and all your growth rings are here. And sooner or later, that dude splits, either in the bottom or in the front. They can't help it. It's the wood shrinking naturally. No matter how well you seal it, no matter what, as soon as that thing gets dry, you transfer from one environment to another and it dries out, it's going to crack. So we have to understand the way wood is structured so that we can properly make the things that we want to make. Now if we split this wood four ways, and again, this is a 10 inch piece, remember. So we're only going to have five inches of wood right here. That's not going to give us a very big kooksa, but it gives us enough for a good round four inch bowl. And once we split that log off and we have this, we can always put that bowl in there with our handle. And our grain on the end of our kooksa here will be running to one side and it won't be stressing right in the middle here where we already have the curvature in our kooksa. Back to our bowl scenario, we cleaved our log. Now, we need to stabilize this wood. If you look at a lot of the old bowls, like the dough bowls and things like that, I'm not talking about stuff that's been turned on a lathe, I'm talking about stuff that was carved out. First of all, when you look at it in profile, they look like this. And this, cutting through those growth rings in this direction and being hollowed out here, what's happened is it's been hollowed out in this direction. And this is your bowl. And this here has been counteracted a little bit by cutting through it at an angle and cutting those circles off at an angle which keeps it from trying to pull apart because you're, initially, you're essentially chopping those growth rings off at the top as you go down at an angle which is going to make it a lot more stable. Okay so now let's talk about using our wood in the round. 
and we can use our wood just as a round piece of wood for lots of things. We can use it for table legs. We can use it for bench legs. We can use it for structures. We can use it for tripods. All those types of things are great for this. But remember that those size saplings are the ones that are going to grow into those trees that will make lots and lots of things. So practicing coppicing will give you lots and lots of these that you can strategically harvest if you want to, as well as, in future, bigger pieces that you can harvest to do all of the other things with. So you harvest the bigger log, make all of the things that you need. While you have coppiced this, it's growing new shoots and lots and lots of smaller trees that you can use for other things. So really the important lesson here is to, number one, understand coppicing and understand how to manage your resources. And number two, to understand how to utilize those resources once you have them, because you want to make them as long lasting as possible. And I have been guilty myself of cracking lots and lots of spoons, several bowls, several kooksas, because I didn't take the time to understand the wood and how it acted with its environment after it was harvested to make something utilizing the wood for its strengths and trying to avoid its weaknesses. I'm Dave Canterbury with the Pathfinder School and Self-Reliance Outfitters. Appreciate you joining me for this video today. I thank you for everything you do for our school, for our family, for our business, all of our sponsors, instructors, affiliates, and friends. I'll be back with another video as soon as I can. Thanks, guys.